Our, our next speaker uh, is Gregor Eichela. So, so the history with Gregor goes way back to the uh, inaugural Atlas project. Um, one of the real benefits that we had in getting off the ground with such an aggressive project and timelines was that the technology uh, was already uh, well on its way to being developed and robust uh, in Gregor Eichler's lab for doing automated in situ hybridization. Um, and so Gregor uh, was very involved early on in the Atlas project for a lot of technology transfer. I remember my first year, I probably went to Houston eight times uh, to, to go visit uh, his lab and, and do a lot of technology exchange. And indeed, uh, the first thousand genes from the Allen Brain Atlas were generated in Gregor's lab at, at, at Baylor College of Medicine. Um, and so we're, we're, we're really pleased to have uh, Gregor uh, here today. He's now at uh, Max Planck Institute, uh, and we'll welcome Gregor. Okay, thank you very much for these very kind words of you. But I also realized that David Anderson was really one of the promoters of this project. So I am, of course, very grateful to his uh, activity making it possible that the Allen Brain Institute started with this project. Now, I'm not going to talk about gene expression, and actually I'm not going to talk about what you could sit, consider the brain. I'm looking at things between the brain. So fluid dynamics in the brain, this is the topic. And if you look at the MRI image, for example, of a human brain or of an elephant or a mouse, you notice that most of the mass, of course, is neurons and astrocytes and uh, nerves. But there is, in all these brains, there are cavities, interconnected cavities, which are known as ventricles. Now, in the human, for example, uh, the ventricles shown here in the center as a, as, a, as a cast. Here in reference to the brain, they extend quite uh, over long uh, distances. They have a volume of about 25, 30 milliliters in the human brain, and uh, they're organized in a lateral ventricle, which is very extensive, as you see here. And it goes into the third ventricle through the foramen of, uh, uh, foramen of Monroe, this third ventricle is bipartite in humans, but also in, in many other species. Of particular interest for today's talk is this part here, which is a narrow pouch that goes deep into the hypothalamus, uh, juxtaposed to the many important nuclei, one of them we just heard from David Anderson. And uh, then the third ventricle continues into the fourth ventricle, and uh, then here the ventricular system ends. Now this is not empty, this is filled with the famous cerebrospinal fluid, short CSF. The CSF is actually made by structures that uh, go into the ventricles, the so-called choroid plexi, shown here in red, there's a choroid plexus in the lateral ventricle, in the third ventricle, this reddish area here, and the, in the fourth ventricle is the choroid plexus as well. Now the choroid plexus, uh, the, the ventricle, sorry, uh, is uh, made of a cuboidal epithelium. And what is very special is that towards the inside, this epithelium is ciliated. Cilia are eyelash structured uh, uh, protuberances from cells, about 0.2 micrometer wide and about 15 micrometers long, and in the case of cilias in the ventricles, uh, they are bundles. Now coming back to the CSF, this is a section through the uh, hindbrain of a mouse. So here, fourth ventricle. And you can see that the fourth ventricle outlined in, in red here is filled with tissue. And this tissue is the choroid plexus. This is a secretory epithelium where the cells are tightly sealed. And if you look carefully, there are blood vessels inside that bring materials from the periphery into the choroid plexus. And uh, these are then like solutes, like uh, uh, metabolites and sugar. What is happening here? There's a connector loose somewhere. Okay. Did I, did I, is that something I can change here? Well, let's try. OK, so uh, the choroid plexus is also producing CSF itself. And a large number 
of solutes, hormones, uh, peptides, and so forth. So this is what uh, fills the ventricles. The question I'd like to discuss with you today is, how does the CSF move in the ventricles? So one way of, uh, one type of movement is because the choroid plexus produces CSF, it is squeezed, the CSF, through the ventricular system and exits at the fourth, fourth ventricle. But I mentioned there are also the cilia, and so presumably the cilia are involved, this is a, a long-standing idea, in moving CSF through the ventricles. The question I like to ask specifically is, is this just a bulk flow that is basically catalyzed by cilia, or is there some organization in cilial flow? And if that were the case, can we actually draw, if you will, street maps of the cilial carpet, bringing components of the CSF to specific target sites within the ventricular system. So the work I'm going to talk about was chiefly done by Regina Fauber, a graduate student in my lab, and she focused on the third ventricle in the mouse, not in the human, for the reasons I had mentioned before, because the third ventricle uh, has a ventral pouch that reaches deep into the hypothalamus. And if you wanted to uh, influence hypothalamic functions by goodies present in the CSF, this would be one way to do. Now, there is a second part of the third ventricle, which is this dorsal pipe. It's a whiteboard pipe. So CSF comes in from the lateral ventricles. And because this is such a whiteboard pipe, presumably goes mostly along this axis into the fourth ventricle. But as you can see here, there is also a diversion, a little tube that goes down into the pouch of the third ventricle, the ventral part. And there's an exit as well. But you can see, if you're an engineer, very little would presumably go in here, but most of this ACS would, would flow right past the ventral pouch, unless there were ways of uh, propagating CSF movement within the ventral pouch. And of course, these could be the, the cilia. The question is, are these cilia all neatly arranged in the ventral pouch? So like rowers in a boat, propagating laminar flow of CSF from the front part anterior to the posterior part out, or is it more complicated? To uh, address this question, Regina started with uh, preparations of this pouch. So what we are looking here at is basically a, a dissection, a fresh dissection of the ventral part, uh, cut open at the top, put into medium, and then a pipette releasing fluorescent beads, one micron diameter beads, was used to deliver these beads into the pouch and one would expect that maybe they would just flow through and then uh, exit at the posterior end, which is on this side. But if you look, this is actually not what's happening. The beads move on a little bit, and then certain, suddenly they get engaged in a semicircular vortex. So uh, it looks like sort of an invisible boundary even beads which have passed a little bit forward move back. So we interpret this as cilia decorating the walls of the third ventricle pouch here and here, creating this movement. Now, so what is going on? This is complicated to work with these three-dimensional objects. So what uh, Regina did in the next is she took the pouch which, whose interior is covered with a cilial carpet and split it open, like schematically shown here in this book. So the cilia then would look upwards, away from the pouch, and then you can put this into a small chamber and put it into a microscope where you have differential interference contrast and a reasonably fast camera, and then image the cilia. So now this is a flat mount, if you will, and here on the top left, you see such an image. Here we are looking at the entrance of the third pouch. 
third ventricle pouch. And if you look carefully, you can see the cilia, right? And if you look even more carefully, you might be able to see the cilia bundles. These uh, spots here, the light spots, are one micron beads, just to give you a sense of the dimensions we are talking about here. Now, just to remind you of how cilia move in a mammalian cell, and you can see that here. So for, at a side view, you see the cilium in its forward stroke in green, lashing out like this and retracting sideways. If you look from the top, you see in the forward stroke, the cilium is pretty much in a plane and then, of course, goes back sideways. The cilium is a nanomachine, if you will, and a very brief summary on its structure is shown here. So they protrude out of cells as singles or bundles. And the defining feature is, uh, in a cilium is the axonem, which is a, an assembly of microtubules. In motile cilia, there are two central microtubules, which are separate singlets, and there are nine doublets around the periphery. And of course, the cilium, being a protrusion from the cell, is coated by plasma membrane of a, of a different composition than the cell's own plasma membrane. The cilium is anchored by a basal body into the cell. It's important to realize this is a very dynamic machine, so proteins from the uh, cell body migrate or are transported up uh, by specific motors to the tip of the cilium where the cilium grows, but there is also a retrograde transport into the cell, uh, so the dynamic of the cilium is maintained by upward and downward transport. So let's get back to uh, the experiment from Regina Faubel. So in this uh, first experiment, uh, Regina uh, uh, looked at the dynamics of bead flow or of transport in the entire third ventricle. So this is again the scheme of the third ventricle. She made a flat mount by this open book uh, trick and then put this into a small dish which uh, contained medium and a homogeneous solution of one micron uh, fluorescent beads. Then she took uh, images. Uh, as you can see, this is quite large, several millimeters in each dimension. So there are several images which are mosaic here together, stitched together. And a bead tracking program was applied so one could actually follow the trajectory of these beads uh, on the cilial carpet. And the, uh, the directions are color coded here. So, for example, here beads that move towards 7 o'clock, I use a clock face as a coordinate system, are in red. Those which are moving towards 2 o'clock are shown in white. So, let's look at the dorsal whiteboard tube. So the first surprise came, so this is this structure here, right? The first surprise came, so in principle, the CSF should flow in this direction, right? But you see, at least in the ventral part of the dorsal whiteboard tube, there is a reverse flow towards 7 o'clock, going backwards, so in this direction. There's also a forward direction higher up. In the inlet tube here, at least at the bottom, you can clearly see this is this part here, here. There is a flow towards uh, the ventral, 7 o'clock, 5 o'clock. This is the way it should be. This is the pouch itself. I will talk to, about this in more detail just in a second. And the outflow, this guy here, shows the uh, flow towards 2 o'clock, which of course is what you expect. So it comes in here, gets turbulent here, and goes out. So this is actually quite remarkable that uh, you can image these things and uh, I promised I would look now with you at this pouch here. It's obviously a very complicated flow pattern. Here, uh, at, at the higher power, more detail, the pouch, right? So this is inlet, outlet. And you can see that uh, 10 minutes after this pouch was prepared, this uh, mouse killed, brain taken out, pouch prepared, so it's a very, it's a very uh, fast procedure. You can see that the inflow is indeed, here's again the color code. This is this other wall, so that's why it's switched. Uh, coming down, here is a region where it goes towards uh, whatever, two o'clock and so forth. Now, if you let this preparation sit for about five hours and even longer, you see there's very little change. There are a few more of these spots here, these are beads that got stuck. So over an extended period of time, which is good for an experimentalist, uh, you get very little changes in the flow pattern of uh, 
uh, of this uh, ciliated epithelium. Regina was able, when she looked at dozens of these preparations, to distinguish a total of seven domains of bead flow, numbered here from one to seven. The obvious question was, to what extent would that reflect the underlying beating of uh, cilia? So remember, uh, when you have a top view of the cilium, then you can see that the forward stroke is essentially in, in a plane, in one single plane. So when you take movies and average over, say, 500 images, as done here, you see as a dominant feature this forward uh, active stroke. And uh, this, is been, this averaging has been done here. So for example, region one, that is this one here, you see a trend towards a, a seven o'clock, represented by this yellow arrow, and this is exactly the direction of the bead flow. Another example here, number three, domain number three here. So the direction of the stroke is towards two o'clock, and this is, of course, also towards the direction of the flow. So clearly, the, what we measure here in, in the bead uh, flow direction reflects what happens underneath by the, by the cilia. Now, we have compared the left wall and the right wall of a third ventricle. We have compared young animals and old animals, and we have compared mice from black 6 and the SV29 strains, and we see that there is a essentially conservation of these flow patterns and the beating direction of cilia. So that, that is, is quite interesting. However, there is also some time difference, and since some of the people in my lab are interested in circadian clocks. We looked at two times of the day. One, in the case of mice, a light day for us is, of course, the resting period. So, and then 12 hours later, a second cohort towards the end of night, which is the end of the activity period. And if you look carefully, there are quite some difference between those two. And this, uh, for example, here, at, the, at this uh, early, uh, late day, early night, you can see that this very dominant uh, flow of domain two reaches all the way down to the ventral uh, floor of the pouch. And the domain three is kept at bay. It's, it's there, but the, there is no contiguous flow. If you now look roughly 12 hours later, you see that this downward flow is interrupted at the expense of a much more prominent uh, two o'clock flow by domain three. So this suggests that there is a daytime dependence of uh, the uh, flow pattern in the third ventricle. There are other differences in the center here uh, which uh, are more subtle. So uh, the top two diagrams uh, basically give a synopsis of the flow patterns at the two different time points. As I had mentioned before, the dominant downward flow in the early time point and then this, this lateral flow at the later time point. It is sort of tempting to speculate this, that this has something to do with the regulation of the circadian clock because at the base of this domain here, resides the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which, as you know, is the seat of the master uh, clock in the mammalian brain. So it will be at the end of the uh, resting period, will be a downward flow, and then uh, at the end of the activity period, it will be away from the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which really sits very tightly, very close to the ependema of the third ventricle. What is interesting, this last experiment I'm going to tell you uh, about today is when you look at a mutant that is lacking a, a, a circadian clock because uh, the BMAL1 gene, which is the a main activator of the circadian clock cycle, is deleted, you can see that the domain 3 flow, which is very prominent at the end of the activity period, is, 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 is uh, the persistent uh, uh, flow 
when you look at other time points in these animals, they are basically the same as shown here. So we are somewhat cautious about saying that the circadian clock regulates uh, aspects of the flow pattern in the third ventricle, uh, but it looks a little bit like that. So what is the purpose of all this? Um, the CSF contains a large number of compounds, peptides, proteins, small molecules, hormones. And what we have found here is that these compounds are not just uh, pushed through the ventricular system, but apparently there is a mechanism in place, namely roads defined by cilia beating in a given direction that can deliver these agents to a particular site. And of course also remove uh, products that the neurons produce from a particular location. So for example, a number of neurotoxins are found in the CSF. In Alzheimer patients, for example, you find beta amyloid precursor. And so there is a road map or a roadway inside the ventricle that is, uh, we believe, uh, provides a good opportunity to, to bring substances to and from particular locations. There have been a number of papers that deal with CSF, but very few have really addressed the issue of localization. And one uh, example of such a study which has done that is by Sawamoto and colleagues, and they found that uh, a, a slit, which is a chemo repellent, is produced by the choroid plexus and delivered specifically in the lateral ventricle to the neural progenitor cells in the subventricular zone. So I think for the future it would be very interesting to look at uh, this uh, system in diseased brains, in mouse models, let's say, of neurodegeneration, in mouse models of stroke, and of course also in models where the celial function is impaired by genetic mutations. So I, I like to stop here and uh, acknowledge uh, the people who were involved in the work. As I was saying, uh, Regina Faubel, who is a graduate student in my lab, has done most of the work, but she was competently helped by Christian Westendorf, a former graduate student of Ed Eberhard Bodenschatz, one of my colleagues, a director at the MPI for Dynamics and Self-Organization. He has been instrumental in, in writing the code for these various tracking programs and putting the tracks onto the serial carpet uh, interference contrast pictures. And uh, i like to have one last slide, which on the one hand shows very nicely these complicated serial patterns, which I uh, have mentioned. And of course, uh, I also like to acknowledge uh, Paul and Jody, who really, you know, have uh, done marvelous uh, work, uh, support for what the Allen Institute has been doing the last uh, 10 years. Thanks for your attention. I, th I thought it was interesting that the left and right sides were doing the same thing. So is the direction of the individual cilia beat? Um, I thought it was chiral. I thought it was normally counterclockwise, as you showed in the drawing at the beginning. So did the ones on the opposite side beat in the opposite direction? Uh, that is a good question. Yes, I think, I mean, in, in these, these whirls which I showed in the first base, of course, they go down like this, right? And so they must be bo both beating downwards, right? So they are mirror symmetry, right? This is a mirror symmetry uh, direction. What is kind of, uh, this was not your question, but what is sort of an interesting point is how you can, can get these changes like what we see at different times of the day. Another piece of work we've done, and I have no time to talk about, is that we found that several of the key components of the psyllium are clock controlled. But we don't yet know how this translates into maybe structural reorientations or other things. We have a 
Based on your measurements over here, uh, oh, sorry. Do you, can you estimate how much the ciliary beating would uh, change the time constants for, for flow? And also, how would that scale with um, different sizes of brains? Uh, well, the, you know, these beads uh, move at, uh, let's say, over half the dimension of this third ventricle, which is in the mouth about three, two millimeters, two to three millimeters within a second. Now, I think in larger animals like elephants, uh, the volume there is 240 milliliters, I guess. In ours, is about 25 milliliters in the mouth, probably 10 times less. These are not very large differences, right? So in the mouth, it would take a couple of seconds from a bead. A bead could be also a compound, go from one end to the next, and an elephant, it would take a minute or whatever, right? It would be very interesting to look at larger models, whether these pathways are the same. But I think it's quite fast. Not like what you know, David was saying, right? That's a millisecond business. We are not in that business. But in the second business, I would say, which is fine. Yeah. Hi. Uh, this being a symposium, there's room for speculation. I'd like to know if there's any thought been given to the uh, mechanisms of control or intelligence in the uh, governance of, of uh, cerebral, cerebral spinal fluid with regard to uh, cilia. So, uh, can, I don't quite understand the question. Can you be a bit more Yeah, just, so, just to, sp I know, like I was saying, this being a symposium, mm -hmm. there's certain latitude for speculation. I'm hoping you will engage in some here. Uh, there must have been some thought or discussion about mechanisms for control on cilia action, because as you saw, you know, in the daytime variants, mm -hmm. there's, mm -hmm obviously some kind of feedback mechanism. Any thoughts to how that cilia intelligence is uh, transpiring? Yeah, I mean, uh, if I understand correctly, let's say that you know, the cilia components, of which there are about 2,000, we, we've found that maybe 5%, as usual, are, are clock controlled, right? So then, for example, one of them is called, uh, or is, is a protein at the foot of the cilium called rutletin. So that rutletin uh, is involved in polarity of the cilium carpet, right? And so if that were different concentration at different days, uh, times of the day, then it could be that the cilia re reorients. Cilia in the ependema are aligned, uh, for example, at the front end of an ependymal cell, and it could be that there is some rearrangement so, and the turnover uh, is actually quite fast of protein. So this could be realized in you know, the time scale of an hour or so. So I think this is probably the mechanism by which this works. Protein-controlled protein controlled and trans also a, an important control would be transcriptional. Right. Okay, I think Good. we should go ahead and move on. Let's thank Gregor again.